January of 1996, basically 22 years ago, a meeting of the American Astronomical Society was brought to silence over one picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Taken over 10 days in December of 1995, this audacious image was gathered by pointing the telescope at a tiny patch of sky only 0.09 arc seconds wide. A patch of sky with nothing in it. Now you gotta understand, the Hubble was still brand new at the time. Time on the Hubble was a precious thing, and here somebody wanted to spend 10 days looking at nothing? Who would do such a thing? This was the brainchild of Dr. Robert Williams, who at the time was the president of the Space Telescope Science Institute, and to say that this was risky would be an understatement. But Dr. Williams wanted to really push the telescope to its limits. What could it show us that we've never seen before? And what it showed us was more than anybody could have ever expected. More than 3,000 galaxies in a space in the sky about the size of a grain of rice held at arm's length. Every single dot in this image is an entire galaxy made up of hundreds of billions of stars from billions of light years away. This was more than just an awe-inspiring glimpse at the vastness of the universe. It was a look back in time to some of the earliest stars and galaxies that ever existed. The power of this photo can't be underestimated. It was followed up by the Hubble South Field, the Ultra Deep Field, and the Extreme Deep Field, all of which confirmed that this soup of galaxies extends out in all directions all around us. But it was this first deep field photo from Hubble, a photo taken on a whim, that has completely changed our perspective of the cosmos. Some people have called it the most important photo ever taken. That is what scientific advancement can do. When Hubble was launched, everybody knew it was going to blow our minds, but it still managed to surprise us. So just imagine what we're going to find in 2019 when NASA launches a new space telescope that's 100 times more powerful than Hubble. It's the James Webb Space Telescope. A telescope so powerful, it'll be able to see to the beginning of time. So earlier this year, I did a video on the top news stories to look out for in science in 2018. Some people said that I should have put the James Webb Space Telescope on that video, but I didn't because it is actually not going out until 2019 now. It was scheduled for a while to come out in 2018. It has now been pushed to 2019 so that they can do more testing, which is fine. Let them do their testing because they got to get this thing right. Plans have been in the works to follow up Hubble before Hubble was even launched, but it was in 1996 when they created the Next Generation Space Telescope Program, or NGST, designed to build a bigger, better Hubble. Can't help but notice that that was right after the Hubble Deep Field photo was released. Probably had nothing to do with it. The project was originally planned to be $500 million, that's going to change, and they reached out to Lockheed Martin and TRW for designs. In 2002, NASA named this telescope after James Webb, who was a former NASA administrator who actually guided NASA from Mercury into Apollo, and awarded the contract to TRW, who later that year were bought out by Northrop Grumman. By 2005, it was clear that the original plan for the James Webb was completely unrealistic, so they did an entire new replan of the project, this time with a $4.5 billion budget and a 2013 launch date. That's gonna change. The project moved ahead slowly after that. It missed pretty much every deadline, but it did pass all of its Mission Critical Design Reviews, or MCDRs. Every single part of the ship had to be an MCDR compliant, which it did do, but that takes time. The project was rebudgeted again in 2011, this time with a whopping $8.8 .8 billion budget and a 2017 launch date. And that's gonna change. At this point, it had swollen so large that the U.S. Congress actually voted to defund the project. This was later reinstated, though. As I mentioned previously, the launch date has now been pushed to 2019, although they have stuck with that budget so far. It should be noted that the U.S. is not shouldering all the burden for this. The James Webb Space Telescope is actually a coordinated effort between NASA, the CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, and the ESA, the European Space Agency. So let's talk about what we're getting for this $8 billion, shall we? The first thing everybody talks about with the James Webb Space Telescope is the mirror. Or, I should say, mirrors. The collecting surface is a massive 6.5 meters diagonal, or 21.3 feet, as tall as a two-story building. The only way to get a mirror that size into place is to fold it up, so the mirror is made out of 18 hexagonal gold-coated beryllium units that fold together to make one surface. By the way, the mirror on the Hubble, you know, the mirror that gave us an unprecedented new view of the cosmos and changed our perspective on everything, is 2.4 meters. This dwarfs Hubble. And unlike Hubble, which could see in the infrared visible in ultraviolet wavelengths, the James Webb Space Telescope is focused primarily on infrared. The reason for that is because the James Webb Telescope's primary function is to find the furthest and earliest stars and galaxies in the universe. Think of the Hubble deep field photograph on steroids and meth. 
And because of the expansion of the universe, the further away a star is, the more redshifted their light becomes. So the furthest galaxies will be redshifted way into the mid and deep infrared. The problem with capturing light in this wavelength is that anything that gives off heat gives off infrared radiation, so you have to block all that. The James Webb Space Telescope does this in a few ways. The first is just where it is. Unlike Hubble, which orbits around Earth, the James Webb Space Telescope will orbit alongside Earth in the L2 Lagrange point. So Lagrange points are these spots in the orbit of a planet where the gravitation of the planet and the star kind of even out. Uh, there are five on each planet, and uh, James Webb will be on the L2 Lagrange point, which is on the other side of Earth from the Sun. By doing this, it ensures that all the infrared radiation from both the planet and the Sun will be on the same side. Then, all you need is a giant-ass solar shield. The solar shield on the bottom of the JWST is freaking amazing. It's a four-layer polyamide membrane with aluminum on one side and silicon on the other that keeps the dark side of the telescope down to below 50 Kelvin. The trick with infrared telescopes is that in order to see these wavelengths, you have to be really, really cold. Like, so cold that even the heat from the computer on the telescope can mess with the readings. That's why most uh, infrared telescopes don't last very long, because they have to have coolant on board to keep everything cold, and when that coolant runs out, it stops doing its job properly. But the James Webb cools passively as much as possible through these heat shields. They are the size of a tennis court and thinner than a human hair. They have to be insanely thin to keep from weighing too much. In fact, everything about this telescope was designed so that it could be foldable so that it could be launchable. The James Webb designers were heavily inspired by origami, the Japanese art of paper folding. The unfolding process for the James Webb Telescope will take more than 14 days once it gets into orbit. These will be two very long weeks. Because the probe is going to be going way out beyond the orbit of the moon, 1.5 million kilometers away. If any of these meticulously designed unfolding procedures goes wrong, it's screwed. We ain't fixing it. You know, the Hubble has been such a success, but so many people forget it was kind of a disaster when it first went up because there was a problem with the focusing mechanism. All the images came back fuzzy and worthless. It was only after a really amazing uh, repair operation from the space shuttle that it got back online and became the telescope that it is today. This will not be an option with the James Webb. So that's why I am fine with them pushing back the launch date. Test, test, test. Make sure this thing works. The mission is expected to last about five years with the goal of it maybe stretching out to 10. It won't, unfortunately, have the staying power that Hubble has, not just because of the coolant issue I mentioned before, but also because the L2 Lagrange point is not a stable orbit. They're doing what's called a halo orbit over there, and that actually requires some propellant, which also will eventually run out of juice. But once it's up there, it is going to be able to see further than any other telescope in human history. It'll be able to see the first stars and galaxies forming, the very beginning light in the universe after the Big Bang. It'll also be sensitive enough to do spectral astronomy on exoplanets. So basically when an exoplanet passes in front of its star, when it does a transit, the light passing through the atmosphere of that planet, the James Webb will be able to determine what the composition of that atmosphere is. So don't be surprised if we discover a whole lot of new habitable exoplanets in the next five to 10 years. One specific star that the James Webb wants to focus on is KIC 8462852, or Tabby Star, which I covered in a video about a month or so ago that will probably be completely outdated the second James Webb takes a look at it. But just like the Hubble, the biggest results from the JWST are the ones that we can't even imagine right now. And that's super exciting. So James Webb is considered a next generation telescope. You might be asking yourself, what is the next next generation telescope? Where do we go from here? There are many ideas in the works, but one of the top contenders is the Large UV Optical Infrared Survey Telescope, or Louvois. Louvois is a 12 meter mirror telescope that will be able to see in multiple wavelengths, including the visible spectrum, which James Webb can't do. It will be used to study galaxy formation in the early universe, much like the James Webb telescope, but one really cool thing about it is it's gonna have an onboard chronograph, which will actually block out the starlight, meaning it'll be able to get visible confirmation of exoplanets like no other telescope has been able to do. And best of all, it looks like something that was designed by Supreme Leader Snoke. Now the reason we like space telescopes is because it gets clean light from stars that has not been disturbed by our atmosphere. You know, we like our little twinkling stars, but we don't want them to twinkle when we're studying them. But with advanced computer technology called adaptive optics, ground-based telescopes are able to adjust for that disturbance in the atmosphere to get clean pictures like never before, and this opens up a lot of opportunities. Enter the 30-meter telescope in Hawaii. Perched atop Mauna Kea, the 30-meter telescope's mirror has a diameter of, you guessed it, 30 meters. 
with a collection area of 655 square meters made up of 492 individual segments. This will have capabilities from the ultraviolet to visible to the mid-infrared range, giving it a wide spectrum of wavelengths that it can cover. The 30 meter has run into a lot of delays due to protests from native Hawaiians who believe that the land that they're building it on is sacred. Apparently the peaks in Hawaii are considered sacred by the natives. So it's been delayed many times. It actually got shut down in 2015 by the state of Hawaii and then the Land Resources Board re-approved re their permits in 2017 to start building again. That is by no means a guarantee that it will move forward. If it does get shut down again, there is a second location in the Canary Islands that it might move to. There are a couple of other extremely large telescopes worth mentioning. One is called the European Extremely Large Telescope because scientists are so good at naming things. It's actually got a 40 meter mirror on it. And then there's one called the Large Magellan Telescope. Both of those are gonna be based in Chile. But all this is dwarfed by the Chinese 500 meter Aperture Spherical Telescope, or FAST. This is a radio telescope that is twice as big as the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico. It's actually already gotten some first light in 2016. It's already started working. I think it discovered a couple of pulsars, but it's not fully operational yet. Won't be fully operational for another few years. Right now, the James Webb Space Telescope is scheduled to be launched from French Guiana on an Ariane 5 rocket sometime between March and June of next year. And these other massive telescopes, these ground-based telescopes I was talking about, are supposed to go into operation in the early 2020s. We might be entering a whole new golden era of astronomy over the next 10 years. Imagine waking up every day with a new image as mind-blowing as the Hubble Deep Field. I don't know about you, but I can't wait. So which one of these telescopes sound the most interesting to you? Is there one that I did not mention that you're really excited about? Uh, and think back on the Hubble. Like, what has been your favorite discovery and image that's come out of Hubble? over the last 20 years. Talk about it in the comments. Thanks you guys so much for watching. If you like my t-shirt, you can have it, or this one, or any other of dozens of t-shirts that are available at theanswerswithjoe.com slash shirts store. Lots of really cool designs there. Go check them out. Also, this video is sponsored by cankerboy.com. If you get regular canker sores, you don't have to deal with them anymore. There is a vitamin supplement that can knock it out. In 70% of people, it is worth a shot. You get a free money back guarantee if it doesn't work for you. Just go to cankerboy.com and give it a try. Big thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon who help support this channel. This is pretty much what I do now, so your support really does mean the world to me. It really does help. Uh, I have some new people who have joined the tribe I want to call out real quick. We got Ryan Breeze, Kobe Dillian, uh, Mansoor Gomri, Devro Bouchard, Aurelio Rosa, Sexton Violets, Akash Alphonse, Breakthrough Media, Giovanni Calero, Strongbow, my favorite cider, Rogerio Fontes del Resende, and Dale Western. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to free perks and hear me murder your name on camera, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. All right, like and share if you like it. And if this is your first time here, I invite you to check out some of my other videos. And if you like those, hit subscribe because I come back with videos just like this every Monday. All right, thanks a lot for watching. You guys go out and have an eye-opening week and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.